Good to be together with the saints on this Wednesday, middle of the week. I was noticing in Genesis 16, in verse 13, an interesting little brief statement. And the whole account is in Genesis chapter 16, verses 7 through 14. Before I get to that, I didn't learn this particular song I'm about to mention from singing it in the congregation because, frankly, it was so old. It uh, had ceased being sung by a lot of folks. And a lot, it was not in a lot of hymnals when I grew up. But I learned it from Mama standing at the sink. She got dinner ready. And it was, um, there's an all-seeing eye watching you. All along the road to the soul's true abode, there's an eye watching you. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. I don't know why people quit that, but in my second full-time work in Arkansas, they had a little green hymnal. I'd never seen it, but it had a lot of those old songs in there that I recognized Mama would sing that were not in our hymnals that we had at church and you'll see why that uh, that came to mind here if you look at Genesis 16 here in this passage of scripture Moses records for us Hagar's plight as she fled from her mistress Sarai she was reassured by an angel of the Lord that God would be with her, and this encouraged her, and it caused her to make this very profound truth in verse 13. And it is, thou, God, seest me. Thou, God, seest me. Well, she may have hidden from Abram and Sarai, but she was not hid from the all-seeing eye of God. So at this time, I would like to cause us to focus on a very important matter for us in living the Christian life. Sometimes we think we have to go through a whole lot of things and various studies and whatever to get to a given important point, but you don't own this one. Thou, God, seest me. He sees all his deeds, our deeds. He searches all our hearts. He knows our good and evil thoughts. He knows our motives. Acts 1, verse 24. And as the psalmist said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Verse 1 of Psalm 139. Then if you drop down to verse 4, he says, There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Of course, this is emphasizing the ever-present and omniscience of God, which is so easy for us to forget that whatever is the object of knowledge, God knows it, and nothing can be hidden from him. At all times for us in living the Christian life, we must be acutely aware that we are not able to hide from God. As I said, he knows all our doings. He knows our goings and our comings, and he beholds every act. The writer of Proverbs made that very clear in Proverbs chapter 15 in verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Well, with that being the case, since God always sees us, we should look at it another way. We must look to God. It's not at all a discerning thing, disconcerting thing to know that he watches us. If I say if, 
if we're also looking to God. The psalmist also declared, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Psalm 16, verse 8. The child of God, in being faithful, must maintain a consciousness of God's abiding presence. The scripture reads again from Proverbs 34, 21. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all things. Now the question is, are we conscious throughout the day that God is so very near us and is, we may put it this way, from a human way of expressing things, silently observing all that we do, even to our intents and motives, seeing all we say, how we say it, whatever we want to do or how we plan to do it. It's because of our sins that man seeks to hide from God. It was after they had eaten the forbidden fruit that Adam and Eve sought to hide from God in the garden. And it was after the apostle Peter had denied Christ and Christ had looked at him and brought all those things back to mind that the Lord told him he would do that he went out and wept bitterly. Back in the Old Testament, it was after Jonah had failed to obey God in preaching to the Ninevites that he sought to hide from God and thought he could get on a ship that could take him far enough away that he could be away from God. I think any of us would say that trying to hide from God is nothing but foolishness and folly. And think about it for a moment. When you love God and you want to keep his commandments and you went and you want his strength and his providential care to be with you, you want him to hear you in prayer. Aren't you glad that he knows all things? In Hebrews 4.13, the writer of Hebrews said to us all as Christians, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open before the eyes of whom of him with whom we have to do. Again, Hebrews 4.13. So for one who trusts in God based upon God's good word, Romans 10, 17, one who walks by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, while this is a very comforting thought, for God watches for his own. And as the psalmist said, he that keepeth thee will not slumber. Psalm 121, verse 3. We also need to realize that God sees us in a different light than our family, and friends, and especially close friends, and other loved ones may see us. Men are influenced by reputation and by their own power of influence the way this world measures that kind of thing. And that can be a factor that influences our in folks and how they look upon us. But I read 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. I think that's one of the greatest challenges that faces any of us in trying to walk in the footsteps of Jesus is to remember that God does not see just the outward appearance as we mere mortals do. And we must understand that in our dealings one with another and when we strive to preach the gospel to those outside of Christ who need to know it and believe it and obey it. Man will judge by uh, one's formal education, and even among those who get a formal education, or what school they went to, and all this kind of thing of uh, the culture that he is from, uh, 
whether he's a prestigious person, however the world measure, measures prestige and the kind of clothes he wears and whether he's wealthy or not, and on and on you can go. But God is judging what he sees in the heart, the inward man. And the Son of God performed miracles. Men believed, and that was what it was, they were meant to cause people to do. But in John 2, verses 24 and 25, we read this. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man. For he knew what was in man. So Jesus, in his judgment of people, then and certainly when the judgment bar of God is before us and we stand there, then there's nothing hidden from him. And his judgment will be a righteous judgment. It will not be influenced by any of the things that influence people here on this earth in such matters. God sees us in our everyday walk of life. We should remember that God watches our business dealings, our quest for entertainment, and our efforts to serve him in whatever it is that involves practicing pure and undefiled religion and visiting the widows and orphans and their afflictions and keeping oneself unspotted from the world, James 1, 27. Just ponder what this consciousness of God's presence would do for all of us. The husband may be far away from his wife, but God's wherever he is and wherever she is. The son or daughter may be separated from parental care and guidance with God's there. And Christians may be far away from the saints with whom they regularly worship. But God still sees. There's no, there's no realization that will keep one true to gospel principles of living the way that God expects us to conduct ourselves in this life, more than Hagar's little statement, thou, God, seest me. I might pause here and say also that every word in the Bible is there for man's good. And when we read these accounts of old, would we ever really think what a lesson could be brought out I guess what Hagar said, thou, God, seest me. And I wonder sometimes in our meditations, in our examinations of ourselves, we ponder things, and as we pray to our God, if we should not also say, thou, God, seest me. God will also see us for what we really are when the judgment day on high comes, where God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14. All lines lead to that most important gathering where God awaits all of us. We cannot escape it. And the faithful don't want to, because they've been aware of the fact that thou, God, seest me all the days of their life. His abiding presence has always been one of the stays of the faithful Christian. But I'll close with what Paul said to the Roman brethren, Romans 14, 12. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's actually his 2 Corinthians 5.10. We can't escape that. Because that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. 
whether it be good or bad. Again, I say 2 Corinthians 5.10. Now Romans 14.12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So let us, in the midst of this busy week, as the world rushes on, for the most part, unmindful of God, unmindful of his abiding presence, unmindful of his omniscience, unmindful of the judgment that us as God's children keep all of it alive in our individual lives and in our dealing with others and fully realize that every step in life leads to the final judgment of God. Eternal life hangs in the balance and our conduct in this life determines our final destiny. So I simply end where I started with Hagar's simple, bold, profound statement. Thou, God, seest me. Thank you.